Well, today, as, as I come to speak to you, I was just reminiscing this week, just thinking back about a few dreams that I remember from my childhood. I'm not talking about like aspirational dreams, like, you know, growing a resplendent moustache or something like that. I'm talking about the dreams you have at night as you're sleeping. One of the, the probably the more distressing dreams I remember, and I say this with the reservedness that uh, if there's any psychologists or dream interpreters watching, then I know I'm going to get a flurry of emails kind of telling me what's my dysfunction. But that aside, I remember this one particular dream. I grew up in Mogul out on some property in a little cottage in the side of a hill. And one day I found out that across the river was Wacol and those orange lights I'd see every night out of my childhood bedroom window were actually the lights of the prison. And uh, that probably wasn't wise to let me know that because I dreamt at night that these prisoners escaped and they, like, in some kind of Neanderthal kind of menacing way, were canoeing across the sky straight to my bedroom. Not not exactly an encouraging dream. Um, But the other dream that I remember, um, there's those ones closer to home where... I'm sure you've had those nighttime dreams as well, where you kind of, in the dream, you're somewhere that seems familiar when you look around, but then you realize it's actually entirely foreign. You feel like you're in your house, but you look around and it's not your house. I remember dreams like that regularly. My wife has dreams like that all the time. We're in our house, but it's not our house. It's something foreign and different. And I remember the feeling in real life, actually, when I got to do some travel, and I remember walking through the streets of San Francisco, and I had this exact same feeling. It took me straight back to those childhood dreams where I looked around, and everything seemed so familiar, yet everything was entirely foreign to me when I stopped and paid attention to what was going on around me. This week, as we come to our second part in this series on why church looking at the things that church is about and the things that God created us for, I kind of get the same feeling like when I start to talk about the church as a gathering for God's glory, it looks familiar, but when you get to those spaces where God's glory is in the room, everything feels entirely foreign. Not good or bad sometimes, just different. And it can be unsettling and it can be something we're not familiar with, but as we stop and unpack it, I believe God's got something for us today that will help us step into a place of encountering his glory as we come together as church. What's challenging when you come to talk about this topic is that I don't want to do a theological message on God's glory. That's it's a thing, it's amazing, and that's all about him. But I want to talk about today how his glory interacts with us as his church when we gather together. This series is unpacking what this whole church thing is about. And I don't want to get stuck in definitions and explanations. There's a million textbooks and handbooks and theologies written on this. There's all sorts of ways to slice the pie, but we want to look at just how to avoid assumptions and find the best way to connect with God and to connect with others. Look at some of the best biblical descriptors of what it means to be church together, what we have in common with each other and how we can express that as we come together as this thing called church. So last week, Pastor John began this series and he talked about what it looks like to gather as family. A loaded phrase maybe for some of us, but important because we have one God, our Father, and in Ephesians he says, he's the Father of us all. We all get our name, our identity from this same Father. We're a family. We looked at the why of family, why God would do that, why he would create this space where such different separate people with all sorts of backgrounds and lives come together and meet. This week as we get to this idea of of gathering in God's glory, I think there's actually quite a simple um, illustration that for me helps me get my head around the why we're a gathering of God's glory. And I'm indebted to the author and theologian John Walton for this picture, but what I want to do is if we go back to the very start... I love to go back to the start because the start helps us get the why because when we get to the beginning, we find that the scene is set. Beginnings give us context. It establishes the information that we need to know to understand the whole story. And the beginning of Genesis is exactly that, a context which gives us understanding for the whole story. So suppose for a moment... Just bear with me here and don't send the email. I know that you're about to pen, some of you. Suppose for a moment that as we get to the first few chapters of Genesis, God may not be necessarily dealing with the actual creation of the physical universe, of molecules and materials that make up this world around us. 
There are other great passages in Scripture that describe God creating everything in the material universe out of nothing. Go read John 1 and Colossians 1. They help us get that doctrine of creation out of nothing. But when we get to Genesis 1 and 2, we see God ordering the universe. We see God taking chaos and making order. When he makes order, he creates meaning and gives value. And the creation account, we often stop at day six when humanity is created, but creation took seven days and and that's important. And the seventh day is essential to understanding what God was doing in the beginning that helps us understand where we as church come and gather in his glory. So think about it this way. When we talk about the creation of the material universe, molecules and atoms, substances, elements put together, you could think of that as the building of a house, the pouring of the slab, the foundation being laid, the the plumbing, the electricals, the structural materials, the composition of the house. But when we read Genesis, I think God is explaining to us not the how and the what of material creation, but he's showing us that he's building a home. He fills the house with all the things that the people who live in the house will need. Time and seasons and provision for food and nourishment. But that's not the purpose of the house. The purpose of the house is for it to become a home to dwell in, to abide in, for communion and relationship, for a family to take up residence in. And the seventh day of creation is essential because that's what God does then in the space. Once it's full of plants and animals and lights and time and humans, he rests. Not just to catch up on the sleep he missed out on so he can get on with the running of the universe, but he moved in. The boxes were unpacked. The furniture was in its place. He abided in the created space. You see, God built a home, not just a house. And as we know from the creation account in Genesis 3, God saw fit to dwell in it with us. He didn't just stop over on the way to do something more important. He created a home for his family to live in and to live with him in. And don't miss that because it's key. God is transcendent and greater than the created material universe. And yet we know from the beginning of the story, he saw fit to walk in the cool of the day with the first humans he created. Don't miss it because it's the key to this whole thing. God was in it with us. So if we step into this world of of Genesis, into this ancient world written for ancient people who understood a different culture to what we understand, they would have seen this creation story not as how to build a house, but instead the creation of a dwelling place for a God. And, And what does the ancient world call a dwelling place for any God, let alone the God? They call it a temple. We've kind of lost some of that in our our modern Western world. I don't know where you're watching from, but there'll be people watching right now who are familiar with temples full of statues with pictures and images of their gods right in the middle of it. It's part of daily lives all around the world. Maybe not so much for us here in Brisbane, Australia, but it's a familiar thing for people to understand that a temple was a place where a god would dwell and interact with those who followed after them, who worshipped them. This is kind of what God's doing as we read the beginning of Genesis. The problem is that for for most temples, and we get this from some of the stories even in the Old Testament, the people who worshipped the God knew the God didn't really live there. They knew that their gods that they worshipped, the the Canaanite gods, they didn't live in the temple, but they they would put a picture, a statue, an image of the God right in the middle of the temple. So stop and think about it like this for a second. If we actually open up scriptures and read the passages that talk about what God's doing in the moment of creation, what does it say? In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, 
It says, Then God said, Let us make man, humanity, in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every other creeping, creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God says and then does make us in his image. And I think this is why there's such a big deal about idolatry throughout Scripture, because we're creating pictures of this God that we want to try and worship, but that ruins God's plan. It ruins the entire setup, and it helps, and it destroys, and doesn't help us understand where we sit today, because humanity living in the created world, we are designed to be the image of God placed in the middle of his temple. When we give up our place and put something else there, we give up our identity, our purpose, and our intimacy with God. And if we take these chapters of Genesis as God putting order into his sacred space, he actually gives this same purpose to us right in the middle of his creation. It says in in verse 28, just the next verse from what I read, and God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and every other living thing that moves on the earth. God creates order from chaos and he gives us the same instruction. Already we see God saying, here is who I am and I've made you in my image. So go and do the things that I do. A familiar refrain. See, this God is different. He's not like the other gods of the nations around the ancient Israelites. He's not like the gods we see around the world today. This is a God who is outside and greater than the material universe, ultimately transcendent, and yet he chose to dwell in it with us. He saw fit to walk with us in the midst of it. And now, don't get me wrong, I'm not preaching that we are gods. We're created beings, we're finite, we're fallible, we're created on the sixth day. But God makes us in his image to be the presentation of the reality of who he is right in the middle of the sacred space he set up. Why is this important? Why would I spend so much time talking about this? Because this sets the scene for what's to come. It sets the meaning and the purpose of who you and I are meant to be. The players on this stage, we find ourselves with a God who creates a temple for his creation to dwell in, a creation that bears his image, that's his representative, that's his agent, his worker, his delegated authorities that operate within his sacred space. God set it up. And there's a word that we don't find in the Bible, but we've used sometimes that you may or may not be familiar with, but it's used to describe what we see in the Bible regularly. And it's the word Shekinah. It means the glory of God. It's the glory of God that's seen in his manifest presence. It's the weightiness of who God is and what happens when he shows up, when he's present with his creation. It's the Shekinah that we lost when The first humans in the garden rejected their role as representatives of God and decided that they were better at doing God's job than he was, ironically desiring what they already had and rejecting what they had in an attempt to gain what they already had. It's complicated. We stuffed up. But the story continues. God has always sought to seek a way to create and recreate and restore the sacred space for us, those who carry the very image of God in ourselves. In the Old Testament, it was the tabernacle and the temple. It was the place where the Israelites who were called out of the nations, is the place where they, they camped around it, they traveled with it. The very presence of God dwelt in the center of it, right above the Ark of the Covenant, a resting place for the manifest glory of God. The Shekinah glory of God. A place where God would dwell and humans would come and minister to him and then take the reality of who he was back out to all of the people surrounded by his chosen ones. But this didn't work out either. 
The brokenness of humanity rejected his invitation to dwell, to be with him. It's too much to be the family of God. It's too much for Israel. They couldn't stay there and the glory departs. We see at the end of the Old Testament, the nation is broken and separated and taken into captivity. The, the people mourn, the presence departs. It longs to be with his people, but they're not a dwelling place anymore. They've rejected being a home. They've forgotten who they were. But the positive is, and this is where we're going now, that God didn't throw the whole thing away. The plan wasn't faulty, but instead we find ourselves meeting Jesus in the Gospels, where it's as if Genesis is happening all over again. It's as if God's invitation to Abraham and to Moses is happening again. But this time it's not the Shekinah glory dwelling on the ark, it's the Shekinah glory walking around. It says in John 1 that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. It's the same picture. God dwells with his people again. Jesus came to restore us, to be those who reflected the glory of God. But and the next absolutely essential step Jesus had specific work to do. He had to die the death that we deserve. He had to live the life that we were unable to live so that we would have access again through his death and resurrection back into dwelling with God, to abide with him, to live face to face in intimacy with the God that we were created to love and abide with. But Jesus knew that in at least one sense, he was limited by his humanity. One place, one time, Even though he did everything under the direction of his father who was outside of space and time, Jesus knew that God's plan was bigger than just 12 disciples and a few hundred followers in a dusty nation under Roman rule. Jesus says as much to his disciples in John 16. I tell you the truth, he said, it's it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. See, we we can forget how important that moment is if we get get distracted and don't keep reading. Because just a few pages later, as we finish John's gospel and find ourselves in Acts, we see the fulfillment of Jesus' words in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, it said in verse 1, they were all together in one place, the disciples. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We call this the birth of the church. When the promised Holy Spirit comes, the promise of Jesus to establish a people to carry out his purposes on the earth. Sounds familiar, sounds just like the garden, right? Acts tells us the story of the church as it forms and begins the mission of Jesus in this world to bring shalom, peace, order out of chaos, the kingdom of God breaking in. And so the the picture of the church we find then is a gathering of people marked by the presence of the Holy Spirit, the promised one, the God who has truly become Emmanuel, God with each one of us. Paul then unpacks this in in a way that I really want us to grasp, and I've talked about it before, but I feel like we just need to keep talking about it till we all can grasp it and hold it. He says to this church, in this town of Corinth, which is a crazy mixed up town where all sorts of things go on that, man, it's just, it sounds like church. People from all walks of life with all sorts of opinions, doing all sorts of things and some of them resonate with the heart of God and some of them clash with the heart of God. And yet in the midst of it, Paul speaking the words inspired by the Holy Spirit says to them, do you not know Each one of you reading my letter, he says, and each one of you hearing my voice, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He's within you. 
the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Jesus made you his own. You, the one hearing me right now, the one listening, the one who has said yes to Jesus, he's made you his own. He's the Lord of your life. You're a dwelling place for God, for the Holy Spirit, for the very presence. Remember the Shekinah glory, the weighty presence of God. You're his chosen sacred space. He calls us to be a holy and called out people, set aside for his purposes. And I get it wrong all the time. I'm not perfect. But what I know is that he's called us to be his own. He loves us and he gave his life for us. Not that we would have to work out a way to be holy, to please him, but he's made us holy because he loves us and we're pleasing to him. And and that's fine for each one of us, but the reality is he's called us to be a people, a called out gathering and assembly, the church, temples of the Holy Spirit, all walking around together. And Paul understood this and he says just a few chapters prior to that moment where he said that you have been bought for a price. And he says, do you not know that you, you all, Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. When we gather as the church, as his called out dwelling place, we are a holy people, a royal priesthood. People created to carry his presence, a dwelling place for God, the place that God designed his Shekinah glory to rest. That's what I mean when you can walk around somewhere that looks entirely familiar, but the reality is it's totally foreign. We're not a club, we're not a social group. It might look like that to the outside world, but I feel like that's where we get unstuck because we were designed to be a resting place for the tangible, weighty presence of God. We look like a social club sometimes. We're a bunch of people that mostly like each other, sometimes even love each other. We come together and we do shared activities, but that's not what God had in his heart when he said, let there be light. Let this house become a home. Let it be a dwelling place for my people who will carry my glory. This matters because we're still God's chosen people. What he said in Genesis echoes. When Jesus said at the end of Matthew's gospel, go into all the world and make disciples, preaching the good news. That's bringing order out of chaos. That's bringing the kingdom of God where God's rule and reign is effective into the places of darkness and dysfunction and brokenness. Yes, I believe that all humanity is created in God's image, but not every person is filled with the Holy Spirit. And those that are, the church is made up of those people, the dwelling place of God, the temple of his presence where God, the Holy Spirit abides. That's why we're not a club. That's why we're different. For better or worse, God saw fit to do that, to make us his people, to make us the ones who would take the revelation of who he really is to the world around us. He started with 12 and it was pretty quickly just 11. (laughs) But then it grew and it grew through broken yet passionate people who are willing to lay their broken lives before a good God and let him fix them, restore them, make them these broken jars of clay, a container for his glory. Doesn't make sense. 
It doesn't make sense. Like, it doesn't make any sense. If any of us were planning this, we wouldn't do it this way. These broken people with all sorts of dysfunction, with these mortal finite lives who get sick, who, who do just stupid things. <laughs> Yet God says, I made you for my glory. Yeah. I made you for my glory. So this comes to the pointy end. That's the why that I've given you. But the reality is, it's our very identity and it's our very purpose. We can be a passive container, a passive resting place, a fireplace for his glory. And that's fine, but I feel like there's more to it than that. Because he didn't make us inanimate objects. He made us people with will and emotions and passion and direction and purpose. He made us people who are able to move around this world to express the manifest reality of this God. When Jesus was laying out what it looked like to be one of his kingdom people in the Sermon on the Mount, he says in Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth. But if it's lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. It's not just about evangelism. It's about our identity. We are the salt of the earth. If we live other than as salt of the earth, we have no purpose. We have no point. We have no reason for being. And I feel like the place where we find ourselves unstuck and disconnected and frustrated is because we've had a revelation of who we are and we've chosen to step out of that place. Lose our saltiness. The place where we become unstuck the place where the world soaks in and pulls our attention away is because we've forgotten that we're salt. We've forgotten that we're light. We've forgotten that God set us in this world to be resting places for His glory. Think about it this way from Ephesians chapter 3. Paul writes this in verse 20. Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. When we give God space to manifest his glory amongst us, to rest on us like at Pentecost, to welcome him in, he promises that His glory will be on display and He'll go beyond our wildest dreams. And he, he's, the, he's the salt that I hope to whet your appetite with, to mix my metaphor. I've seen Him do it. For many of you listening right now, you've seen Him do it. We've seen Him heal bodies. We've seen Him restore broken relationships. We've seen Him heal and mend. We've seen Him break addictions. We've seen Him bring such hope, such dignity, that His glory has been on display. We've seen Him create us as a people of His presence. And that's what we've decided to be. A family who embraces His presence. It's our number one thing. It's the first thing we seek because everything else comes from that. When we seek His presence, He empowers us. He lets all humanity come to Him when He is lifted up, it says in John's Gospel. When we seek His presence. I said earlier that we're a dwelling place for the Shekinah glory, but... I look at my life and that's where, that sounds familiar, but it looks foreign. I have glimpses, I have moments where I'm aware of His goodness and His mercy, where it, it visibly impacts my body and it, 
and it impacts others' lives because of it. And I've run with people, some of them called to vocational ministry, others who are are ministers in the front line, who know His presence and who minister it. We glimpse, we see bits of it. We don't see it in its fullness. Because I, I think this is the challenge for today because there's a cost. There's a cost. It costs something to seek first His kingdom and not the things of this world. It costs something to take up our cross and follow Him. It takes something to deny ourself, to put aside what those around us who don't know Him tell us is, is important. It costs something to fix your eyes on Jesus. It costs convenience. It costs comfort. It's not an easy thing, but man, it's the best thing ever. says in Hebrews 6 that without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, I've, I've wrestled with what that looks like. Is it just, is it just a, a conviction of belief? Well, yes, but there's more to it. And I, I just want to share with you this, this, one, this one experience I had, which I, I hope will speak to you in a way that maybe what I've said so far hasn't yet. We're, we're, just, we're just wrapping this up now. And so I just want you to start being help me aware of what the Holy Spirit's stirring and saying and doing in this moment. But I, I believe it takes belief that we are a place for the dwelling of His glory. I believe that we have to know, we have to understand that that's who we're created to be. But I think there's a conviction that grabs a hold of our lives that draws us forward to act upon that belief. And what I remember is I was in a prayer meeting. And sometimes they're horrible, I know. Sometimes they're boring. Sometimes you've got a million other things on your mind. I have to repent of that often enough. But I was in a prayer meeting, the Lord spoke to me really clearly and He laid it on my heart and I, I got to that kind of righteous indignation where I could barely get the words out and I was so worked up and emotional I couldn't almost communicate it. But I felt like He said, what if the breakthrough was just another 20 minutes? What if the breakthrough was 30 more minutes of praying? What if, if the transformation in someone's life, what if the healing, what if the breakthrough of revival for our city, what if it was just another 30 minutes? What if it was another hour on your knees? What if it was 15 minutes? What if it was giving just a little bit more? What if it was counting the cost and pushing through discomfort and actually saying, God, if I'm a dwelling place for your glory, it's got to make a difference. What if that's all it took? We can't see what it's going to take to find the breakthrough. But when we are people of His glory, He calls us to contend. To seek His face. To dwell and abide with Him. That's what He created us for. And to live any other way is to live below who we are. He's gracious enough that He says in 1 John 2, Don't live below who you are. But if you do, don't worry. I've come to restore you. There's an invitation to step back into that place today. He forgives us for where we've given up, where we've seen that it's all too hard, where we thought, no, I can't do this anymore, God. He forgives us and He restores us and He sets us on the right path to go again. And I believe for some of us today, that's what He's calling us to do that we know we've tasted and we've seen that He is good, but we've let the things of this world, this season of life that we've just found ourselves in, distract us and discourage us and and mix our heart's affections and take our eyes off Him. He says, fix your eyes back on me. Come and abide with me. I forgive you. Nick Riddell said to me just before I got up to preach that, He heard someone say this week, 
why wouldn't you want to go into the secret place? There's already three people waiting for you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are waiting to meet you in that place. They're waiting to meet us as His glory, gathering people coming together into His presence. So I want to pray right now. I want to pray that God would help us to move through our shame and our disconnection and our discomfort where we know maybe we've dropped below who we're meant to be and ask Him to restore us into that right standing that we'd be a people for His glory, that as we gather, His Shekinah will come rest on us, that we will be found worthy of people to be a resting place for His manifest presence, a gathering for His glory. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you that you made a way, that you made us to dwell with you, to carry your glory, to be your people, to seek your face and to find you. And I thank you that you're not far off, that you are not a God who separates himself from us, but you're a God that said, I will dwell with you. I will dwell in you. So God, for those of us today who have tasted and seen that you're good, but we've allowed everything of the world to take our eyes off you. God, we say sorry, we repent. So God, we've taken our heart away from you. We would want to turn it back to you right now. God, I choose you over the things of this world. And God, I'm sorry for where I've let who I am be overshadowed by circumstance. God, would you forgive me? Would you set me right? Would you stand me in the holy place, the sacred space, the temple you've created to meet with me? And I choose to abide with you there. Holy Spirit, would you come and fill me afresh today? Let your presence come and flow through my entire body, my heart, my spirit, every part of me. God, would you no longer let me be distracted by the things of this world, but God, would I fix my eyes on you? Would my faith cause action that brings a smile to your face that pleases your heart? God, I choose you today. I choose you again. I count the cost and I step through convenience. I choose you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.